I wanted to be a jihadist. I was jealous of my friend who went to Syria and fought in the conflict there between Sunnis, Alawites, and the whole sectarian conflict that is happening and the revolution. He, he came back to college in a wheelchair, but at least he defended Darul Islam, and, um, which means the House of Islam. And uh, I was jealous of him, and he had a meaning in life. He, what is, what's jihad, though? I mean, what is jihad? Well, jihad is defending the land of Islam as well as gaining new ones and uh, submitting people to the message that was sent to us by God. And uh, it's a belief that whenever it is uh, not possible to reach an area and preach and to let people, it's considered like war against the infidels and just to, uh, is as justified as a meaning of spreading the message. And once people will be living in an Islamic state, they will know the beauty of Islam and then they will join in. Did you feel like Islam is beautiful? I felt it's beautiful. I felt it's the meaning of life. I felt it's a, a way of life. And it was everything I, I have ever known. Where did, you, where did you live and kind of what did your life look like as a practicing Muslim? I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, but I never lived in the US. We moved when I was one, I think. And uh, then we moved to Jordan, and I spent my whole life there, and recently came back two months ago. Just two months ago? Yes. So you left Islam yeah. while living in an Islamic nation? Yes, that was five years ago. So I'm, I've been an atheist for five years, and uh, I've been public about it, but I, uh, a lot of, like some of, uh, of uh, former Muslims are, but I didn't reach a wider audience or a wider, uh, I wasn't too known up until I went to the UK for the International Conference of Free Expression. And I gave a speech there about Islam and about Islamophobia and the differences between the West and the East. And when I came back, that video was spreading on YouTube and people began to know more and more. And uh, because we had an incident in 2016 of an atheist who just posted a cartoon and that cartoon fired up and began to be very uh, viral in Jordan, the government decided to prosecute that man for blasphemy. And although he got bailed and he was moving down of the uh, stairs of the courthouse attending his, uh, the court, uh, he was moving down, then when a, uh, an imam came to him with a gun, and he shot him three times and killed him. So we had that in 2016, so when the video was spreading, I thought that um, I'm moving up to be the, the, uh, the next person, maybe. And you then I- to your life? Yes, then, that's when I left. Did you blog, did you speak? Uh, I was the founder of the atheist community of Jordan, and um, it was something online. There, there was many groups online, but n there was no social interaction between atheists. So we set up a date to meet, and we made it so far away that everybody can be there. And we had all of the, those security measures of changing the location every few weeks, up until we had like few people we can send that exact location to. And then 27 atheists showed up, which is a silly number here, but it's a great number there. And that meeting began to be more uh, frequent and it lived into becoming like a, a social club for people to, to, some people got married out of it, some people had an interaction to it, because it's very difficult to live in a country where only one religion calls the shots and it's uh, very hard to enter, to have a social life. You feel like people have that innate desire to be free of it, to be free and be able to live outside of it? the religious constraint of Islam? Of, of course. The, we have a saying in Jordan, if there was a voting for a secular country and for a, a Sharia-ruled country, everybody will vote for the Sharia-ruled country, but, every, but then they will run away for the, to live in the, in the secular one. 
because the feel, uh, uh, feelings and emotions are all into your main identity, which is a Muslim. But to think about it, living under Sharia, uh, living the, the way Saudi Arabia is, or Afghanistan, or Iran is, is something horrible uh, to a degree that people might not want it, want it actually. If they are brainwashed enough, they would feel that it's uh, beautiful and it's the way of life. Which I was uh, after <coughs> thinking about it too much. And then when I decided to be either a preacher one day or a jihadist, and then I stumbled upon a video of Richard Dawkins talking about evolution. And I was like, well, why are, are these people still talking about this? Like, it's, we have been taught in ninth grade that th this is complete bullshit. <laughs> so uh, that triggered something in me, like, to know more about the subject that I have no idea about. And one evidence after the other, the whole argument of design collapses. Uh, still, there were many arguments, but that made me think, like, well, if one can go, maybe all the others can. So let's find out more. So the interest in educating yourself, not ju just counting on the education system, which is horrible. So the interest to educate yourself came from just one atheist who decided to be outspoken and published that video online. And that triggered me. That I'm so, I consider myself one less jihadi. So uh, uh, I always tell people here that if you become an atheist in the, in the West, it means like you might be less of a, hom a homophobe, less of a misogynist, um, can change your mindset and, and make you more liberal or more uh, accepting of the others. But in the Middle East, you're one, ex, one less jihadist, one less possible suicide bomber. And I don't mean that every Muslim is a suicide bomber or a jihadist, but there's a possibility one point of, uh, in one point of your life, just like what happened to me, that one point in your life you might consider being more strict and having your morality sub only in the realms of uh, the Quran and the Hadith. And once you have your morality based just on that, you're in trouble and the people around you are. Is there a big underground of atheists? Yes, there is a, a silent underground atheist movement within the Middle East and Islamic majority countries. They're just uh, trying not to get caught? Uh, yes, a, lot, a, a high percentage of atheists there are uh, simply quiet about their atheism. Uh, some people choose to show their faces, some people talk about it online, some people get in trouble, and some people die, apparently. Uh, which is very difficult, uh, not just for the, the person who actually was, this was done to them, it's also uh, to the others who are still there. Like after 2016, everybody was scared to, to um, because everybody thinks that Jordan is a secular country. And the government doesn't do anything. But to please your Islamic uh, opposition, and since you already have blasphemy laws, uh, and one member of society can can believe that apostates should die and act on it, that all that's all what it takes. And a poll was done in 2013 uh, showed that 82 percent of the country believe that apost apostasy, apostasy should be punishable by death only to be beaten by Egypt with, with 86%. Did you ever fear for your life? Every day I feel for my life. Like uh, once you leave, because you already know what, what the punishment for that when you were a Muslim. You don't just become an atheist and go look up what's the punishment for that. You already know what you have become. You've become a murtad, means like the, the apostate. So uh, you already know your punishment, so you already feel that there's a marker on your forehead that is pointing at you, and wherever you live, you don't have to live in an Islamic country. Like, up until now, I still have that feeling. And up until now, I've been working with organizations to help others, but when I call those people and I want to talk to strangers, I've been advised by these organizations not to mention, don't mention your name, don't mention where you live, and don't mention the area of the city that you are in. 
Uh, so here in the US, so imagine how far uh, this judgment is, is ba or this, this, this death sentence is, is uh, upon us. What changed? Why now? I mean, uh, have you moved here? After the video uh, the, that we talked about uh, got viral in July, I think. Uh, of last year, um, uh, it took two months for it to reach Jordan. I had the owner of the company. He got me in, and he was uh, he, he was like, "What is this on YouTube?" And then a couple of friends knew too, and I was public about it between my like uh, friends, my uh, the people around me. But strangers could have found out online, but they couldn't like just locate me or see me in person. And now the people who actually do on a daily basis are watching that. And uh, that was the moment where I, I, I talked to the people in the UK, the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain, and I ex expressed my concerns. And they were very helpful. Uh, they, jo they got American Atheists, uh, Freedom from Religion Foundation, and CFI all together to to try to help and getting me out of Jordan, and they, apparently they did. Last question. How do we help other people like you that are still trapped over in theocracy and Islamic? Well, the least one can do is speak about all religions the same. It's not racism if you speak against Islam. Islamophobia is a term created to be a de facto blasphemy law because I, with all the things I have just told you, with all the names I've been called, I was never an Islamophobe there. I only began to be an Islamophobe when I was outspoken in the here. Because here I'm considered racist while, while I'm brown. Uh, it's a term that's created to silence the criticism of religion. And we are hungry. In the, in the Islamic majority countries to, to be voiced by atheists in the West because they have so, something that is so precious, but they still choose not to use it, which is their freedom to speak, offend, hate, do whatever they want and speak about whatever they want without any prosecution. And they, they look at it as something self-given, it's not that important, and even then sometimes should be taken away. People uh, in Islamic majority countries, atheists, their main fear is a bullet or a machete, just as the one who, that fell on the head of Bonia Ahmad's husband and killed him for being an atheist and took off her fingers out for she, while she was trying to defend him. Uh, that's our main fear. Here, speaking ill of Islam is also censored by self-censorship, for also fear, but it's based on fear of being called a Nazi on a web page. And I find that silly. And people had to actually die in the US and in Europe to give you this freedom. And now you're throwing it away because of public opinion and because of this fear. These you self-censor yourship because you've been shot down of the conversation because you're speaking about a minority. Well, that minority is, you're not even speaking against that minority. And there are some, some acts permitted within Islam that happen within these minorities that shouldn't be respected. And they are, but still people are like, well, this is a cultural privacy. Like the, the woman who got in Texas last week, uh, there was a, a Muslim woman was forced into marriage and she refused that and she got hot, boiled oil on her by her parents and still nobody wants to speak about it. Feminists don't speak about it because it's a minority, you know? Where is the right of that woman? Isn't she an American too? But just because it's a minority, it's considered like it's a taboo to speak against it. Well, moral, in, in moral debates and, and where there is a moral decision to do when there is a moral thing to say, it doesn't matter if you're white, brown, black, or woman, or man. 
your identity or uh, what you are has nothing to do with something being right or wrong. So if you speak about something wrong, you're actually doing the right thing, even if it call, made, if it, if, even if it leads to someone calling you an Islamophobe, for example. Well, bear it, take it, and at least you're speaking for those who have no voice and say, like, well, all right, well, we'll only sting the first time. I'm not at you inside you. You know that you're not bigoted against Muslims. You know inside you that you're talking just about an idea. But those who want to silence you are trying to, to label you in a name that you can never talk, well, embrace it, say, all right, well, I'm an Islamophobe, but I'll speak about what's right. 